This week, the programmers of the future. I felt like Steve Jobs. The cities of the future. And the ugly politics of today. This Thursday, the general election will give more than 45 million people their chance to decide on the UK's future. Is it the Brexit election? Is it the NHS election? Is it an election that will show new divisions that no longer lie along party lines? We'll soon know. Please toughen up. Amidst all of this, there's the usual mudslinging towards candidates. But with social media now in the mix, a lot of it has transferred to platforms like Twitter. Here at Click, we decided to take a closer look at this outrage in the final few weeks of battle, and we sent Carl Miller to investigate. I'm a traitor, I'm a vile creature, a lot of it is misogynistic. I've had death threats, I've had uh, threats of violence to some of my people here. Look, there have been moments in which I've had anxiety attacks because of the level of threats. Being called everything from a lying dog to cheat, traitor or death threats, these are some of the 330,000 abusive tweets that prospective MPs have been enduring in the run-up to the election. But we wanted to really drill down to how much of this abuse was happening, who it was directed to, the nature of the abuse itself and how it was all connected. So we teamed up with the think tank Demos to produce exclusive new numbers for the scale and nature of online abuse in the run up to this general election. This is Josh. He's trained an algorithm to sift through millions of tweets to identify those that are abusive and aimed at candidates who were previously MPs before Parliament dissolved. But the algorithm first needs to be trained by humans before it can sift through the millions of tweets. So Josh is teaching Soiler, a researcher on Click, to help with this monumental task. Crucial to this is how it decides what's abusive versus what's just fair criticism. That's where personal judgment inevitably comes in. What this gives us the opportunity to do is to say, right, right now, in British democracy, that's an insult. The algorithm is about 70% accurate and only includes candidates running for re-election. But after just a few weeks, it revealed some startling results. Around 334,000 tweets, that's around 7% of the total, received by candidates were insulting. That's 10 for every minute of the campaign, minute in, minute out. And a lot of the abuse the MPs received depended on their background, their gender and their stance on Brexit. What's causing this insulting behaviour to arise? Well, some research suggests it's down to organised groups or disgruntled individuals, people who feel isolated from the mainstream, but now, thanks to social media, can enter the public conversation more easily than ever before. Hate is a tactic used by various types of organisations and individuals. They are unified by a desire for someone to respond to them. And we have, as a society, as individuals, we have been responding, we've been engaging with this kind of hate for far too long. And so for the first time in this general election, we've seen mainstream political actors using trolling techniques in order to amplify their message on social media. Um, so the three primary ones, the three main ones, uh, were honesty, intelligence, and this accusation of treachery. When I joined Josh, I was surprised to learn that the main party leaders weren't the biggest targets of abuse, at least as a proportion of all of their mentions. Boris Johnson's right down at the bottom of this. Jeremy Corbyn isn't even in there at all. This isn't a one-party issue, is it? Right, this is much deeper than just a just single attacks on single. One candidate who received an awful lot of this was Ian Duncan Smith. Um, as you can see, right down at the bottom, he also got sworn at a lot. And if you are white, you're more likely to be sworn at and called a traitor than any other um, ethnicity that we looked at. But of course, there are human beings on the other side of the screen. So I visited the constituency of Ian Duncan Smith, 
who told me his way of dealing with all of this is simply never to engage. The problem is sometimes with elections and things, they actually feed this a bit more because they tell everybody, actually, we all hate each other. We don't. I don't hate Labour. Mm. I've got lots of Labour friends. The problem with the internet is it takes that bit of the anger and then accelerates it in because it makes it immediate, instantaneous, and it gratifies rather like a drug. But abuse, of course, isn't just something that happens online. And a day after I visited his office, it was vandalised. Back at the research hub, they generated a huge map of abuse. So this is our universe of abuse. It connects the candidates being abused to the people doing the abusing. The bigger the clusters around a candidate, the greater the number of people that are sending them the abuse. You can kind of see that the most prominent politicians, especially Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn, but others too, almost have their own personal entourages of, of people that, that specifically tend to abuse just them. Here the Brexiters are in pink and the Remainers are in green, both groups angrily surrounding the two main party leaders. On this map, the abusers accusing the candidates of dishonesty are shown as red dots, while on this, those accusing them of treachery are grey. Really the people that are getting called traitors are from the third parties and up into Labour. One of the most surprising findings was that men overall tended to receive more abusive messages than women on Twitter, although of course this doesn't mean that what they did receive was worse or more threatening. Obviously these are broad trends and the experience of every candidate is going to change. Um, take for example Angela Smith, so she is being insulted a lot for her honesty and being called a traitor four times more than the average candidate. Now this could be because she's recently changed parties, so she's now with the Liberal Democrats. She also voted against Brexit. This was against the majority in her former constituency. And she says she's faced a torrent of abuse from anti-Semitism to misogyny. In order to stay sane, I, I do not look at, at most of the abuse that's directed at me on Twitter. I just, I just don't think any individual can cope with that. You can feel the anger behind those tweets and the anger behind the use of capital letters, the aggression. And I find that really frightening. So it seems that whether it's leaving your party or taking a stance on that ultimate of all divisive issues, Brexit, can make you a lot of enemies online too. Next, I wanted to see whether the type of abuse candidates received also tend to differ based on their ethnicity. What we saw here is that if you are a BME candidate, you are more likely to be accused of being stupid, basically to be insulted for your intelligence. Um, a good example of this is David Lammy, uh, who is insulted for his honesty and his intelligence. He's also sworn at an awful lot. Earlier in the campaign, David Lammy tweeted about a report he'd overseen, the Lammy Review, into the disproportionate number of black and ethnic minorities in the prison system. And even he, no stranger to online abuse, was taken aback by the response. I was staggered at the level of abuse that I received. That's an indication of just how toxic things have become. Most of the abusive tweets directed at me are really pushing deeply racist, stereotypical tropes. They're tropes about being stupid. They're tropes about being lazy. They're tropes that involve um, the, um, the N-word. So what does the research actually tell us? Well, there's the scale, of course, 10 online insults of every minute of every day of the campaign. These insults cut across the political divide, but they're also determined by what a candidate says and who they are. And for sure, it's not just happening on Twitter and it's not just happening to politicians. So I think one of the big questions we now have is, as politics with each passing day becomes more digital, how can we make it less angry? Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It was the week that Google founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin stepped down from their current roles at the company. The Alphabet CEO and president will, however, remain on the firm's board. OK, you ready? And Silicon Valley tech firm Peloton has come under fire for an advert in which a husband gives a smart bike costing thousands of dollars to his wife. The commercial has been viewed more than a million times on YouTube and has been called sexist, dystopian and out of touch. Thank you. Transport police in Australia have rolled out AI cameras to help identify drivers using their mobile phones on the road. 
New South Wales Transport previously tested the technology earlier this year, catching 100,000 drivers using their devices illegally. Drivers spotted using mobiles during its first three months of the rollout will receive a warning letter, and after that, they could face a fine. And finally, an electric eel is providing a shocking start to the festive season at a Tennessee aquarium in Chattanooga. The festive fish, called Miguel Watson, powers decorations next to his tank, thanks to a system of water sensors which deliver his charge onto nearby lights. His first name is a tribute to his native habitat in South America, while his surname is a play on a unit of electrical power, the Watt. Now that's a gag worthy of the very worst Christmas crackers. Earlier this year, Amazon Web Services ran Get It, a kids' competition to design an app to solve a problem. The prize? Bringing it to fruition. After stiff competition from various mental health and well-being concepts, this lot triumphed with their web app to transcribe school lessons for the deaf and hard of hearing. A few weeks after their win, I've come here to the team's school, Bishop Stalford's College Prep, to find out a little bit more about what they're creating. So this is our Connect Hero app, and this is how it works if you're using it. The app connects to a teacher's phone, and the teacher has a microphone, so it will display the the, what the teacher is speaking real time on the student's phone. So it'll help them learn in class and obviously understand the lesson more. Now, Ibby, could you tell me a little bit about your hearing issues and how this hopefully will help? Um, so I have 60% hearing loss. Um, and if you focus on something, you get a lot of background noise. So with this app, obviously, because it connects to your phone, you won't have to worry about background noise, hopefully, and just be able to focus on the person speaking. How much of an issue do you find listening in the classroom? Um, I find it particularly hard if like, you're sitting at the front and there are people behind you talking and you're trying to focus on the teacher because often you just pick up the background noise. And of course for lip reading they need to be facing your direction. Yeah. There's also the issue of kids regularly needing hearing aids remoulded as they grow. So how did they get started with creating the app? We looked through the um, things that we had noted down. We thought to ourselves how we could actually put it together so it would be something that works and not a gimmick, so uh, after we found our target audience and everything, we sent the information over to um, Amazon, who judged it, and uh, then the competition started. The competition started and you won! How did it feel when you won? It felt amazing, like no one could believe it. Yeah. I wasn't there on the day, but I have heard that you all gave a very, very good presentation on stage. How was it to get up in front of a big, huge, grown-up audience? I felt like Steve Jobs. You felt like Steve Jobs, brilliant. Yeah, it was very fun. You like, were launching your equivalent yeah. of the iPhone. Yes. When ready, the app will be open source, so it'll be available to other schools. But the process so far, much like creating any tech, has come with its challenges. It's just a bit disappointing that it's not coming out perfect first time. It's an unrealistic standard, but it's just a bit disappointing to know that, like, it, there's a lot more work to be done on it. Some information about this is part of a bigger picture, the direction we push kids in in an ever-changing world. I think with the careers that are opening up for them all, the technology is becoming more important within those careers. It's not just being able to use it, it's being able to have an understanding of what it is and where it's come from. There's a big misnomer, I feel, about artificial intelligence. when they talk, Everybody talks about AI, but they don't actually explain to the, the um, youngsters what that actually means. AI is based on data. It's, it's all it is. It's data that's been built up. And they can take part, they can create things from data. That is a skill set which they use in any walk of life going forward. Do any of you want jobs in technology in the future? Yeah. I'd love a job <laughs> in technology because being an artist it's just creating art. But being an app designer that's creating art and then having it being functional and usable and it's helping so many people. It's just like two levels to it. And how about you? Well, I definitely want to try and put technology into surgery and certain things like, like that, uh, like robotics, because I find it extremely interesting how they manage to do certain things with technology and make it do amazing things. Brilliant. And Lara's new friends aren't the only ones thinking about the future. 
Last week, the European Parliament officially declared a climate emergency. But while most of the climate narrative has concentrated on the predicted catastrophe, filmmaker Damon Gamow has taken a different approach. The power of innovation, imagination, creativity, to sit within all people. So the film is a letter to my now six-year-old daughter, showing her what the world could look like in 2040 if we put into practice the best solutions that are already available. So I call it an exercise in fact-based dreaming. Everything I show her in the future has to already exist right now and has to be scalable and practical in some form. 2040 is a film full of positive possibilities, of a future where solar power generation happens on every roof and energy is traded between households. Animals and diverse crops mix in small agricultural pastures that create healthier soil with deeper roots, which lock in CO2 and hold more water in the land. I met up with Damon at ZSL London Zoo, where he explained that simply sending out negative messages charged with fear and anxiety can actually shut down the problem-solving part of our brains, which is no good for thinking our way out of climate change. When we're only hearing that one side of the story, there's a lot of paralysis for, for some people. So I sort of thought, well, if we're gonna sound the fire alarm, you've also gotta show people where the exits are. All the cars that your mum and I ever owned were stranded assets, meaning that 96% of the time they were parked or unused. Damon's 2040 is a world where autonomous vehicles drive us around and because they're always active, there's no need for car parks. In fact, there's no need for even one car per household, which means far fewer cars on the roads. And that means that we could reclaim large chunks of our cities for green spaces and even to grow food locally in disused car parks. Probably the most exciting solution in the film is seaweed. It's widely accepted that we need to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and out of the oceans in huge quantities in order to slow global heating. And it turns out that seaweed is fantastic at this so-called carbon sequestration. It's the fastest growing organism in the world. It can grow half a metre a day and up to 50 metres long. So what that means is it's just turbocharged sequestering that carbon out of faster than a tree. A frame made of recycled material becomes a platform for the seaweed to grow on. It sits just below the surface and sinks lower as the seaweed grows and gets heavier. The seaweed can be regularly harvested and used for a range of purposes. Our stretched resources and growing emissions are partly due to our increasing consumer culture, but also partly due to an exploding global population. And that leads Damon to discuss a less talked about cause of climate change. There's about 100 million girls that don't get to complete their education every year for a variety of reasons, religious or taken out to put to work. And if a girl is able to complete her education and is given access to reproductive health services plus viable work opportunities, she gets to choose when and how many children she has. And that comes down to two. But if she is taken out of school early, the number is five or more. So the UN says that by 2050, that's a difference of 1.1 billion people, which has an enormous impact on our resources. So empowering girls and women, fantastic. Let's do that anyway. But we get this other bonus with our emissions and resources. Well, Christmas is finally here, having started in about September this year, by my reckoning. Anyway, it means that there are now millions of sparkles and twinkles begging to be Instagrammed. Many of the latest smartphones boast cameras with impressive night mode credentials, but which one is best? Well, we asked Chris Fox to put them to the test. We've come out in central London to try three of the latest smartphone cameras to see how they cope with low light. The Huawei Mate 30 Pro, iPhone 11 Pro and Google Pixel 4 all boast that they take impressive shots at night, but will any leave the competition in the dark? I'll also take some photos on the iPhone 7 Plus from 2016 to give us an idea of how much phone cameras have improved. 
My first stop is this bridge in London. We're going to capture a cityscape at night, starting with Huawei Mate 30 Pro. And Huawei says its phone takes really good pictures at night because the camera sensor in here is 125% bigger than the one in the iPhone 11 Pro Max. So it lets in more light. So how did they stack up? All three of the new phones took sharp, bright photos of the skyline at night. The Mate 30 Pro picture looked slightly more crisp, but the colours were less saturated. The iPhone 11 Pro photo seemed more vibrant, but not quite as sharp, while the Pixel 4 seemed to have a nicer colour balance with a bluish sky rather than the orange tint that we saw in the others. But for me, there was no clear winner here. All of them took nice photos. So my next stop is the embankment. I've come to have my picture taken with the London Eye, and I've got Soiler here using the Google Pixel 4 first. Google says its special source is computational photography. So it's going to take a string of photos and stitch them all together and use machine learning to clean up any noise or artifacts. So I have to hold still. All three of the new phones took a brighter photo than the old iPhone 7 Plus. Once again, the Mate 30 Pro seemed to take the sharpest photo. If you look at my face, it's in focus, and it also picked out a lot of detail on my jumper. The Pixel 4 photo was pretty sharp too, and I felt the colour balance was more flattering. I'd probably be happy to post this one on my Instagram. But in this location, I think the iPhone 11 Pro struggled. It didn't pick out as much detail in my jumper, and the colours just looked weird no matter how many times we took the shot. When Apple introduced the iPhone 11 Pro, it said it would be better at taking photos in dimly lit bars, and it doesn't get more dim than this. This is Gordon's Wine Bar in London, mainly lit by candles. So let's see how the phones manage. And the difference with the iPhone 11 Pro is that I don't have to activate night mode. It does that automatically when it detects it's dark, and it's telling me to hold still while it stitches together several photos, just like the Pixel 4. All three new phones took a picture that wouldn't have been possible on a phone a few years ago. Just like the previous shots, the Mate 30 Pro photo came out brighter overall and sharper, and it's hard to believe this was taken in candlelight. Once again, the Pixel 4 had a more flattering colour balance, and there was less detail on the iPhone 11 Pro shot, which you can see if you zoom in on Soiler's hair. So this might be the biggest challenge for the phones yet. We're in St. James Park. It's very dark, there's no lights here. So will the cameras be able to pick up any photos at all? And will we get robbed for waving around a few grand worth of cameras? Let's find out. That's, looks just like it's daytime. The fact that any of these phones took a clear shot in near darkness is impressive. If you zoom in, you can tell that none of them are crystal clear, but that's probably not the point here. The new phones all took snaps in the dead of night that looked like they were taken during the day. It's pretty impressive how much phone cameras have improved in just a few years, thanks to new hardware and a lot of heavy lifting by the software. Now, I found some of those night mode shots for me looked a little bit artificial, and in some cases, the phones took, in my opinion, nicer shots just in the regular camera mode. The real test was that near darkness shot taken in St. James Park. That was truly impressive, but I wonder how useful that will be for a majority of people and whether people will really want to take lots of pictures in near complete darkness remains to be seen. That was Chris Fox in a park in the dark. And that's it from us for this week. If you'd like to get a hold of us during the week, you can. We live on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.